students, welcome back. This is Torres, Elbow Bump. How are you? Are you doing okay? Is your family okay? Remember, if you need anything at all, you send me that email and I will do what I can to try to help. So lucky you, you get to hear my voice again for another lecture. But the best part is, is we're gonna be talking about how to minimize error in statistical testing. Yay! So in statistics, our goal is to obtain the truth when the truth is unknown. Okay, so what does that mean exactly? In statistics, we're working with the ideas of probability to be able to make an inference about what's happening in the population. There's lots of reasons why we can't know the true statistic of the population called a parameter. So what we're trying to do is try to use the information that we've got in order to make an educated guess about the larger population. We can never really know the truth. That's why we want to start to control error from the very beginning so that we, when we make that final inference, when we make that final guess, we have some reasonable belief that the inference that we're making could be true. So like I said, we want to be able to control the amount of error that we make from the very beginning so that we finally get to the outcome and we're, make, we're able to make an inference about the population, we can make like the cleanest inference we can. We don't think that it's muddled up with a bunch of what they call noise, right? A bunch of errors and things like that. There's things that you can do from the very beginning to start to minimize error. First of all, um, if you have a small sample size, then you're going to have a lot of error because the smaller the sample size, the more susceptible something is to random error. Also, you want to make things as random as possible. If you have, if you don't have a lot of randomness, if things are purposefully chosen, you're going to lead to more error. You also want to make sure that you're choosing the right sampling techniques. So if you have some method of sampling that is biased, okay, because it's being biased and it's being selected and there's less randomness, it's going to lead to more error. Finally, there's things that we do like with calculations when we round. If we round over and over and over and over again throughout the statistical process, every time we round, we're getting a little bit more error. And all that error starts to sort of accumulate and affect the final inference or the, of the outcome. So let's real quickly talk about the process of statistics because this is going to be really important moving forward. I want to just do this quick review. This is something that you probably had last semester. The statistical process has four discrete steps. The first one is always the question. The statistical process always starts with a question about the population. This is super important. So if you're writing this down, write this down now. The question is always in terms of the population not the sample, and you're asking about a statistic about the population, and a statistic about the population is called a parameter. So whether it's a proportion, whether it's a mean, things like that, you're going to, though, and you're talking about the population mean or the population proportion, that is called a parameter. During this time, you're also going to start doing things like identifying the population, figuring out how you're going to get your sample, developing your experimental design. So you're developing like what kind of te uh, sampling techniques you're going to use, your whole process. It's just like like cooking. Like before you start to cook something, you want to make sure you have all the ingredients and then you dive into the recipe. If you get halfway through the recipe and you realize you don't have an important ingredient, then your final outcome isn't going to be very good. This is the same kind of thing. You want to really prep during the prep phase, during the question phase, in order to try to get the least amount of error out of your experiment from the very beginning. Okay, you want to you want to start thinking about what you're going to do if you have missingness. How are you going to create a random assortment? What are you going to do if you have attrition, which is when somebody drops out of the experiment? Those are all things that are happening in the question phase. The longest phase is usually the phase where you're gathering the data and you're using instruments to take careful measurements. For example, if I'm doing a study where I want to look at how well second graders are using a reading program, then the reading instrument might be some sort of reading test. If I'm looking to see how well medication works on high blood pressure, then the instrument that I'm going to use is probably like sphygmomanometer, 
which is like a blood pressure machine. So you want to make sure that you're taking careful measurements, you're putting them down in a place where they're safe. If it needs to be confidential, then that information is kept confidential. And you're starting to compile all the data together. This can take anywhere from days to years to, uh, to compile the data. Descriptive statistics is a lot of the stuff that we did during um, the first part of stats, stats A. And really what you're starting to do is taking all your raw data that you gathered in the second phase and you're starting to organize the data in tables and spreadsheets. You're starting to describe the participants of the sample using qualitative descriptions like gender, race, um, maybe living environment, things like that. And the reason why we do that is we want to make sure that the characteristics of the people in the sample, and I'm just going to stick with people to make things a little bit more uniform. We want to make sure that the physical characteristics of the people in the sample actually match the population that we had in mind. If they don't match, then we have a big problem. So if I'm interested in, uh, looking at how well second graders read, right? And I find that there's um, maybe, I don't know, the teacher thought it would be funny and threw a test in there, right? The teacher's not in second grade. She's not my part of the population. Her scores are gonna really mess up everybody else's. So things like that is what you're really looking to check that everything matches up. Um, you're also starting to do your quantitative data descriptions. So you're starting to run the general stuff that you usually do, mean mode, median, you start to look at kurtosis, skewness, standard deviation, you start to run your um, your different kinds of figures. So you're looking at the histogram, the box plot, the QQ plot, all that kind of stuff happens in the descriptive statistics section. And that's also because you're starting to check your assumptions. You're starting to check, for example, your assumption of normality. So you're looking to see if the information that you're starting to acquire is starting to look like a normal distribution or if something else is going to have to happen. In the last section is when you start to run statistical tests. And once you start to run those statistical tests, which are founded on the theories of probability, then you can use what you learned about the sample to answer your original question about the population. So whatever happened in your sample, you can assume can also be inferred about the population. Do you know the truth about the population? No. You don't know about the truth about the population because you never dealt with the population. You only dealt with a tiny piece of the population. And so when we look to see that, when I say we want to get to the truth, the true population parameter, the true population statistic, we're trying to get as much error out of the way. So whatever we have at the end of this, we've distilled out at the end of this, we're able to make a pretty firm inference, right? A pretty good inference about what's happening in the population using the sample that we used. We'll never know if it's true or not. We can only know to some degree of certainty. So the first situation is um, that can introduce error is a small sample size. The big idea is that as your sample size starts to increase, the closer you are to the truth. Remember, we're trying to get to the population parameter. That's where the truth is held. The issue is, is that we can never really be certain of the parameter unless we're able to actually deal with the, the, everybody in that population. I'm gonna give you an example using the COVID situation that we're in right now. And this year, these are statistics about COVID-19 as of today, April 16th, 2020. So as of today, April 16, 2020, there's been about 2.1 million cases of COVID-19 worldwide, and these are positive confirmed cases. Of those, approximately 500,000 have recovered and are now starting to test negative again, okay? So they're no longer testing with the live virus. In the United States, right? There's been about 650,000 cases of COVID and about 49,000 people have recovered and are starting to test negative for the virus again. Okay. So let's remember this. Now, the NIH, which is the National Institute of Health, wants to do an antibody study. 
And their idea is that they want to know how many people already actually had COVID-19, but they didn't know it. They were asymptomatic. So what they want to do is they want to analyze participants' blood samples for the presence of antibodies that fight against COVID. It's the, and the virus that causes COVID is SARS-CoV-2. Okay, it's a SARS virus. It's a respiratory virus. Now, these antibodies will show up in anybody that's ever been infected with COVID-19 in the past. So if for some reason, if somebody had COVID, they will, for the rest of their life, have antibodies that are inside their bodies. The NIH plans to recruit about 10,000 volunteers for the study. Participants can live anywhere within the United States. They have to be over age 18 to participate, right? No kids allowed. They have to be able to consent themselves and not have to get parental consent. And they cannot participate in the study if they've actually had a confirmed case of COVID infection or if they're currently experiencing symptoms. They're looking for people that have never had COVID and aren't experiencing any symptoms. So if you think you've never had COVID and you're over 18 and you live in the United States, that's the population that they're looking to get to to test. Okay, that's the whole population. They want to know how many of these people were exposed and never knew it. How many of them are immune and never knew it. So let's talk about antibodies real quick and how immunity works. So we can do this with we'll a little science while we're at it. So there's two kinds of immunity. There's active immunity and passive immunity. So active immunity happens when your body starts actively pr producing antibodies to fight infection. So if you have a throat infection, your body starts to create antibodies to try to, fex to, try to fight it. If you've ever had the flu, right? Any regular flu, your body is seeing this as, as something that it needs to fight off. You might also have an, an artificial immunity. And an artificial mu immunity can happen when you are given a vaccine of a weakened strain of whatever microbe it is that you want to become immune to. When you're small, you usually get childhood vaccinations for mumps, measles, and rubella. That's the MMR vaccine. Um, they came out with the chickenpox vaccine probably about 30 years ago, 35 years ago, so you could get the vaccine for chickenpox. The smallpox vaccine, they don't give you any more, but if you ever look like on your parent, maybe your parents on one of their arms, if they have a little circle that's kind of like it looks like their skin was sort of like burned or melted, um, then they received the smallpox vaccination. Those were given to, to people in the 60s and 70s. So if you could have gotten the smallpox vaccination back then, they no longer give it because, give it to anybody because we got rid of smallpox because of the vaccine. Another type of vaccine that you might come across is every year they are always telling people to go get the flu vaccine, and you can you can either get it at the doctor's office, you can go to like CVS or Rite Aid or Walgreens or whatever, and they can give it to you then, right? So that's an artificial way of actually receiving part of the microbes, right? A very weakened strain of the microbes is usually a dead strain of the microbe. And it makes your body see this as an invader and starts to develop an active immunity. So you either get it naturally because you caught something and your body fought it off or artificially because you got an injection and your body started to create antibodies. Okay. Passive immunity can happen, but only for a short period of time. Okay, there's a couple different ways you can do this. It, again, it has natural and artificial immunity. Natural immunity comes from like mothers breastfeeding their babies and they're passing their antibodies through to the children through their breast milk. That's why it's a really good idea for mothers to breastfeed, especially in the first few days after birth, because their antibodies are now being going into the baby and helping the baby fight off infections. Artificial immunity is when they can take a they can take blood from a person that already had a disease and separate it out into the plasma and then inject that plasma into someone that has the same blood type as the first person and now that person is now immune to the disease as well. The problem with passive immunity, either when it's natural or artificial, it, it only lasts for a short period of time. It only lasts for as long as the person's um, body keeps the donated 
antibodies, right, either through the breast milk or through um, a blood transfusion, a plasma transfusion um, in the body. Once the, the person's body has sort of like cleared it out, then um, they are no longer immune. OK, so it doesn't stay in there for a long, very long time. Let's look to see really quickly. I'm sure you guys um, are probably wondering how this whole thing works. If you ever have a chance to take an immunology class, I highly recommend it. I was a bio major myself and I loved tiny, tiny little bio. And so um, this is, I'm actually getting to teach it. So this is how it works. So where's my little pointer? Do, do, do. Okay, so see all these things right here? These all, all these things are called pathogens. You can have bacteria, virus, you know, fungi, um, all kinds of foreign proteins. These are things that can invade the body, all right? And when it, something invades the body, it gets eaten up by this cell called a microphage, just kind of sucks it up. And once it kind of encapsulates, right, it surrounds the virus, it starts to display part of the pathogen. See these little green things out here? It like takes part of it, but it le like leaves out like its leg or something. It leaves out a little piece of the pathogen, right, on the surface. And this little other cell called a helper T cell comes by and is like, what's that? What's that sticking out of the microphage? Let me go look at it. Let me go measure it. And it comes over here and it starts to look at the foreign antigen and it starts memorizing what it looks like. Like it basically is is taking in information so that it can transmit it to other cells. The helper T cell goes and tells two other types of cells, hey, this thing showed up. This is what it looks like. Okay, cytotoxic T cell, we need you to start killing this thing. Okay, we need you to just start attacking it. So these are the things that start to attack the invader. Um, and starts to kill it, okay, the T cell. The B cell memorizes it. It says, okay, let me look at this thing. What does it look like? I gotta memorize this, I gotta memorize this. I gotta, okay, I gotta figure out a way that I'm gonna remember this thing because now I know that T cell is killing this thing and I gotta save this in a memory so that when I see it again, I know exactly what to do and that T cell knows exactly what to do. Like we've done this before. So that's how it kind of works. These antibodies will stay in the body to fight whenever that thing comes back. So, you know, it's like, oh, I know you. You were trouble. I'm going to come after you. I'm going to get cytotoxic CT cell to come after you, and it's going it's to kill you, and now you won't be able to hurt the body, right? B cell is memorizing this thing. Antibodies are like out there kind of looking around and make sure that that when somebody shows up again, when the bad virus or the bad bacteria shows up again, it knows. It's like boom, 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 boom. It starts to signal everybody like we got to come fight this. We got to come fight this. When you're first exposed to a foreign body, right, a virus, a bacteria, whatever, you start to form antibodies pretty slowly, right? As you start to as you start to um, experience it, you start to form antibodies. And if you can see my pointer here, and you go slowly to to the point where the antibodies are fully understanding what this thing is, and the reaction time, the immune response. So the the T cells are fighting it, the B cells are memorizing it. Um, and you start to get better, right? After you get better, you start to reduce um, the immune response. It changes. Now, what happens if you ever come in contact with that again? Well, this time, look how fast it happens. Here it's happening slowly, right? This is weeks. Here it was happening slowly. Here, whoop, within two weeks, it's at full response. It knows exactly what to do because it didn't have that learning curve. It didn't have to figure out what to do this next time. All that information was in the memory of the B cells and the antibodies. The antibodies warned it, the, side of the T cells were like, I got this, I got this. Everybody out of the way, I'm gonna fight this thing because I did it before, right? So isn't that amazing? Like your body's really communicating with one another. So the idea is that if people have COVID-19 antibodies in their blood, perhaps they might be able to have an additional um, 
way to treat people that have COVID, right? They can actually get the antibodies that are in their blood and inject them into people that are sick and not doing very well. Perhaps they're on life support. I mean, it's a terrible, it's a terrible, terrible uh, virus. So perhaps we have an idea of how many people are able to survive it and use that as a sort of an immunotherapy, having our having other people's immune system fight the virus within a different person. If you look at the population, basically the population is going to be everybody in the United States, right? If we want to know what proportion of United States has COVID-19 antibodies in their blood, we want to take everybody in the United States and we want to dis- we want to take away their confirmed cases, right? Everybody the conf- except the confirmed cases. If you ever were confirmed, you cannot participate in this in the study. We just want everybody that has never been identified as having COVID. So if we have 328 million people in the United States, that's how many people we have in the United States, and we subtract the 500,000 that already had COVID, that means that the true population that we're dealing with here is 327,500,000, which is a huge number. Like there's no way you can test all those people. It's impossible. Besides which you don't know like when people are going to get sick and people are going to, you know, move around. All kinds of things can happen. The only way that the NIH can ever know the true proportion is if they tested each one of those 327,500,000 people. That's the only way they're going to know the true proportion of how many people have antibodies in their blood right now. They can't do that. They can only test 10,000. And that's not a small number. That's a lot of people. 10,000 people having their blood drawn to see if they have antibodies for COVID-19. That's a lot. That's a lot of work. Think of like how many times you had to go to the doctor and get blood drawn. Like think of 10,000 people going in and getting blood drawn just to see if they have these antibodies so that hopefully they might be able to help another person, right? So what they're doing is they're taking that 10,000 people because that's all they have access to. They don't have access to all 327,500,000 and they're going to learn from that sample, from that 10,000, so that they can estimate what the true proportion is. They won't know the true proportion because they don't have access to everybody in it. As I've stated several times during these last few slides, the population of Americans that may have antibodies in their blood and not realize that they had become exposed to COVID at some point is approximately about 327,500,000 Americans. And the NIH wants to test 10,000 people in their sample. If they were able to get 1 million people in their sample instead of the 10,000, then they would get less error because it's closer to the population size. 1 million is closer to 327,500,000 than 10,000 is to 527,500,000. If the NIH was able to get a sample size that was even larger, let's say 10 million people, there would be even less error than if they had a million because that 10 million is much closer to 327,500,000 than a million is. Let's just say that they wanted to get 100 million people in a sample. Okay, so their sample size was 100 million there's going to be even less error than the 10 million they had in the last example because 100 million is much closer to 327.5 million that are the part of the whole population, right? We're getting closer and closer and closer to the truth. Let's just say they had enough money to have a sample size of 300 million people. So there only is a difference of about 27 million five hundred thousand people still a lot of people difference right then they would still have they would have less error than when they had a hundred million people because that 300 million is that much closer to 327 million five thousand so basically what we're saying is that the closer you are to your population size the the as the sample size little n approaches the population size, big N, the error decreases. And here we have it going from 10,000 to 100,000 to a million to 100 million to 200 million to 300 million. And the truth is here. 
the truth is actually this should be what two three hundred twenty seven million five hundred but the truth is here okay as a sample size increases right as we go from this sample size being as low as ten thousand all the way up to three hundred million then we have less error because there's less place where the error can exist right we we've pretty much used up everybody in the sample. Now, do we use up everybody? No, we're short 27.5 million, but we're getting closer. So the big idea here is as the sample size approaches the population size, you will get less error. You're getting closer and closer to the truth. Another way that you can um, decrease error is by increasing ramp is by increasing randomness and making sure that you're choosing the right sampling techniques. So random sampling is just the process of using chance to select individuals from the population to be included in the sample. So we got to make sure that we're using the right population, that we're taking the sample from people that actually, and again, I'm using people just as an example, people that actually meet the characteristics that we want to answer in the question, right, that are included as the part of the question, um, to do the experiment and we're gonna use that those smaller group to do the experiment on them. But what does random really mean? Well, as humans, it's it's funny because the more the more we try to be random, the less random we actually are. We're actually making more choices. You probably started to work with the idea of randomness as early as I don't know, maybe second grade, when you had to use these little spinners. Remember the teacher would give you the little spinners and you'd spin to see what number you would get. Um, perhaps you worked with dice. That was another thing that kind of looked at the randomness. Um, you know, there's all kinds of technology now where you can actually just program something to give you random numbers. I personally like to use a website called random.org that will generate random numbers and it uses just ambient noise in somewhere in England to generate random numbers. So it's just, it's dealing with something as random as just the noise that is in the vicinity to generate these numbers. Aside from making sure that you're working with a random selection, you're using randomness in order to select participants for your study, you have to make sure that the sample is representative of the population. If the sample is not representative of the population, then your sample has bias. So sampling bias means that the technique that you used in terms of sampling, like sampling techniques, ways that you choose your participants, you'll have sampling bias if you use a technique that will obtain people um, that tend to favor one part of the population versus another. So you want to avoid sampling bias. Now, there's all kinds of different types of sampling techniques. We're going to talk about four major ones, which are simple random sampling, stratified sampling, cluster sampling, and systematic sampling. So let's talk about the first one. Okay, the first one is the best one ever. Best one ever is simple random sampling. This means that um, the sample size is taken from the population, and if it's obtained through simple random sampling, it has every single sample has an equally likely chance of occurring. Okay, this happened with when we're checking for independence. Remember this this slide from last lecture I think so remember if we're if right now if we had here we have uh, 10 marbles nine of them are blue and one of them is orange so if we were going to look to see of what is the probability that you will draw an orange marble right now it's one out of ten right but let's just say you drew a marble right and you left it outside of the bag. Now the probability of choosing an orange marble changes because now you no longer have 10 in the bag, you only have nine. So instead of a one out of 10 chance of getting an orange marble, now you have a one out of nine chance. The probability is affected. So for simple random sampling, you want to avoid that probability change, okay? Um, like I said, this is the gold standard. This is the best way to sample, is just simple random sampling. It's also the most expensive way to sample, and it's kind of difficult to coordinate. Um, so, you know, it's used when you can, uh, but 
there's times you can't. So this would be like a couple examples that you could use simple random sampling. So let's just say a researcher wants to study Gutman second year students and the researcher can just simple random sample by selecting students from the second year school roster and using some sort of randomization tool. So it's randomly selecting however many participants it needs. Another thing that might um, be a simple random sample is let's just say the mayor wants to survey New Yorkers to assess their satisfaction with the MTA system and they pick 5,000 random people to send text to and hope that they will respond, right? Just 5,000 random people throughout all five boroughs. That would be simple random sampling. Um, you know, it's, it's the gold standard because it is so unbiased, especially when you introduce technology into helping you select the people in the sample, uh, but it can be difficult to do. The next one we're going to talk about is cluster sampling, and this is when there's like natural groups already separating your populations, and you just kind of get everybody in that group to participate in the study. So let's just say um, we wanted um, the researcher, same researcher wanted to study Gutman second year students, and they can use cluster sampling and just select all the students within one randomly selected major. Okay, so like they chose all the human services majors, and they were going to go ahead and use that cluster in order to conduct their study. Another one might be um, the mayor wants to survey New Yorkers to assess their satisfaction, and they um, just picked a borough and selected everybody in that borough to participate. That's also cluster sampling. Now, I'm not saying these are the best choices. I'm saying that's how cluster sampling would work in the, under these conditions. This seems like a more logical way of using cluster sampling. A school wants to conduct a reading study on second grade students. They select all the children in two classrooms to participate. So this whole classroom and this whole classroom are going to participate in the study. That makes a lot of sense, right? Where the other two might be a little strange, depends on what the question is. The next type of uh, sampling is called stratified sampling. And basically what you're doing is you're first separating a group, the population, into two groups that you want to draw from. So um, for example, in this case, um, a researcher wants to study second year Gutman students. This researcher can use um, uh, stratified sampling by dividing the groups into by major and then randomly selecting students from each one of those majors. Okay, so they selected, let's say, five from business admin, five from uh, liberal arts, five from IT, five from human services, five from urban studies. Then they can use kind of, it's a, like a mix of um, the cluster, but also the sampling. You're not using everybody in the cluster, you're separating it out and then you're sampling. This would be the same thing if the mayor wanted to survey New Yorkers to assess their satisfaction with the MTA system. They could use stratified sampling by selecting a few people at random from each one of the five boroughs. That would be a stratified sample. In this situation right here, for these particular uh, examples or scenarios, these two make much more sense to use stratified sampling than when they had we had the cr cluster sampling. I, I want to emphasize that none of these sampling techniques are necessarily bad. You have to look at uh, many factors when you're making decisions on how you're going to run your experiment. One thing is certainly going to be access to all these people. It might be a time frame. It might be money. It might, it could be, you know, it could be what's best for your particular situation. You want to choose the sampling technique that is going to be best for your study and that will, and that can work under the conditions that you have to run your study. So the last one we're going to talk about is called systematic sampling. And that's when you choose like, a certain person out of like a line. So um, it can be a, like, so for example, every 10th person is going to get asked the question. Every third person is going to get to ask the question. Usually this is really good when you have um, the sample, the participants or the individuals of the sample kind of going through one particular way. 
one particular avenue. So for example, if like MTA wants to survey, cu survey customer satisfaction with people that enter the subway at Times Square, they could just be at the turnstile and ask every third person that goes through a question. Same thing with like a car manufacturer wants to test their cars for safety. Maybe they use every 2000th car for, for crash tests. They're picking them at random. They're just going to be like, whatever 2000th car comes through, we're going to pick that one. The news, you see this a lot with uh, what they call straw polls. The news wants to report on how people have voted on the election. They might ask every 10th person that leaves a, a polling place. So this is a, a thing where the people are leaving through a particular door and reporters can be there to count off so many people and get their and get an idea of how they voted if they if they will agree to answer the question same thing is happening with the car manufacturer every 2000th car off the lot gets pulled aside to do crash testing on to see how well this is doing it's it's leaving it to chance this wouldn't necessarily work very well with with simple random sampling like for the car like what are you going to do have all the cars that you've built within the year just sitting in a lot until they can finally pull a simple random sample it's not it doesn't make sense yes it would be the best way it would it's the best way to do sampling but it's not feasible for that kind of study so here they are again this is a uh, simple random sampling where you just take people at random from the population here you have um, stratified sampling where they break them up into groups it appears here in the example they broke them up into male and female and they and then they did simple random sampling after they broke them up into the into the genders systematic sampling they're picking every third person going through a turnstile or something like that and then cluster sampling is you have naturally occurring groups and they just pull everybody in that group in order to uh, do the study the one i will warn you about is convenience sampling and this is the one where individuals were easily obtained by the researcher um, so there's a huge amount of bias um, so anytime you see something that has a convenience study, you want to kind of read over this very carefully. Results should be looked upon with extreme skepticism. It's not that the researcher necessarily did something wrong, but it should be on your radar that there there is a lot there's going to be a lot of bias in here. So there is likely a lot of error. It doesn't have to be because there was something sneaky going on or something sketchy going on. It just could be that that's all they, the researcher had access to. If I wanted to do a research on how well my instructional videos were working, I can. I only have access to my students. I may not have the money to get funded to do some sort of bigger study where I could just find X amount of students, 100 students at random that are taking a first year statistics class. That doesn't necessarily mean that I'm going to do something, anything that's not above bar with my calculations that I'm going to try to present findings that aren't there, but I just couldn't, I couldn't find anybody else. So really all you need to do with convenience samples is you just have to make sure that you read them carefully and that you're skeptical. One of the most famous convenience sample studies, it had to do with a doctor that was looking at the association between vaccinations for um, mumps, measles, rubella, chicken pox and its association to autism right so if you've ever heard that there is that there is a connection between vaccinations and autism there was a convenience study done that kind of brought all this to the foreground right well if you look at the convenience sample basically in 1998 this doctor used 12 of his own patients to look to see if there might be a connection between uh, measles, mumps, and rubella and autism. And he concluded that eight out of the 12 children had autism. And so he published this article, went viral, I guess is the way you would say it now. And everybody started reading about this. It hit the media. And then this is kind of what kind of started the whole the anti-vaccine movement that we have now, that the idea that uh, children may become autistic be due to childhood vaccinations. Since that time, there this study has been reproduced on various levels with much larger sample size, and it has never been able to be reproduced. 
So, um, and also I will say that this doctor ended up losing his uh, license to practice medicine uh, because of this whole conspiracy. So, you know, looking at his uh, information with skepticism could have saved a lot of kids from not getting their vaccines. The last thing I want to talk about in terms of error is accuracy and precision and its relationship to bias and standard error. So when we look at bias, we talked about how we want to make sure that our sample is representative of the population. If we only measured basketball players to estimate the proportion of Americans who are taller than six feet, then there would be a bias for the larger proportion because there aren't very many basketball players in the world, right? Most of them are very tall. That's one of the advantages of being tall and playing professional basketball. Really, if you're looking to get an estimation of the proportion of Americans who are taller than six feet, you probably want to do some sort of simple random study or systematic sampling technique in order to do that. Standard error can be seen as a measure of precision. So the smaller the sample size, then the estimate of the proportion of people using that sample is likely, likely to be very far from the proportion of tall people in the US. The standard error will be very large, actually completely aligned what we, with what we were talking about earlier with sample size. So I wanna look at an example here when I talk about accuracy and precision, okay? And you can get an idea of how accuracy and precision works if you look at if you think of the example of throwing darts at a target, when you have a target, you wanna hit the bullseye, right? That's the accepted place where it would show that you are good at throwing darts if you hit the bullseye. Precision is the ability to hit the same place over and over again. So you can have accuracy without precision and precision without accuracy. Here I have four different scenarios. Let's look at the top left bullseye. Here's my target. The bullseye is here in the middle. If I want to measure if I'm a good dart thrower, okay, if I'm good at throwing darts, then I should be able to hit the bullseye in the center. And also I should be able to hit the bullseye over and over again. If I hit the bullseye, I have accuracy. If I hit the same place over and over again, I have precision. Here I have both, I have accuracy and precision. Let's look at this one right here. Here, I have accuracy because I hit the bullseye once right here, but I'm not able to do that over and over again. Here I hit the bullseye once, and this one I got close, but not real close, you know, but it's still out here in the yellow. This one I got a little bit closer, but it's still out here in the yellow. So I have accuracy because I'm hitting in the pink, but I don't have precision because I didn't hit the pink over and over again. Let's look at this bottom left one. Here, and I'm gonna go ahead and grab my pointer. Here, what's happened? I didn't hit the bullseye at all, so I don't have accuracy, but I have precision because I was able to hit this yellow piece right here over and over again, right? So I have precision. In this case, I never hit the bullseye, and I never hit the same place twice. So I don't have precision and I don't have accuracy. I can increase accuracy by minimizing the bias in my study. I can minimize bias in my study by making sure that I use the right sampling technique and I also use some form of randomization. I can increase accuracy by making sure that I don't do things like round after every iteration of calculation, that I allow the rounding to happen at the very, very end. So what's the big idea? Today's big idea is that error can be introduced into your statistical testing in a variety of ways, like a small sample, like bias sampling, like rounding, like a low level of randomness. You want to avoid introducing error from the start. So that's it for today. With that said, don't forget to check your emails, check Blackboard, do your homework, and subscribe to this channel. Even better, hit that notification bell so you know when there are new videos for this course. Okay, this is your teacher, Tora, saying stay safe, and I will be waiting to give you a virtual elbow bump in the next video. Ciao!